Okay, uh, welcome back to Senate Education 344 on January 14th, Friday afternoon. Uh, uh, Senator Hooker, question, kick us off. Uh, you, and you're muted, Senator. Sorry, uh, no before we go on, um, could I give some suggested witnesses for the waiting study? I'd like to hear more from people like from Winooski um, that we heard from and people from the Coalition for um, Vermont Student Equity. I, we heard, you know, we voted the, the report out. I voted yeah. for it, um, knowing that we were going to have more of a robust, yeah, of course. robust discussion in yeah. committee. So I'll have some names. Maybe I can give them to Daphne and you can absolutely check see about having them. Thanks. Yeah. Anybody that you would like. Uh, I've already asked Daphne to uh, reach out to the Winooski, excuse me, school district in Burlington. But you are uh, the other group that you mentioned, uh, yeah. the, the coalition, you said. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'll and let. I have uh, a couple of names from the Winooski people who you know had testified before. Yeah, great. If you wouldn't mind, just uh, email those to Daphne and uh, just copy me. But yes, anybody you want. All right. Thanks. Great. Yeah. Thanks. So, uh, Mr. Demaray, Ms. Uh, St. James, good to see both of you. Uh, and I've already welcomed Mr. Leonard to the committee. We are returning to some of the issues that uh, we talked about yesterday, and I'm going to ask Mr. Demaray uh, to tee this up. And uh, we have a new attorney that just entered the room. I see her, she's sneaking around the corner. There she goes. <laughs> she's more than welcome to join us since this is the education committee. And it looks like she's midway through. She's involved in education, I'm sure. <laughs> she is, she's... Uh... Got firsthand experience of first grade right now. <laughs> great, that's great. So, great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr. Demaray, the floor is yours. Okay. So, um, good afternoon. Uh, for the record, Jim Demaray, the consul. So, yesterday we were speaking about the um, aspects of your bill that deal with anti discrimination. And one of the areas that we were talking about was the area of the uh, ability of uh, churches and religious organizations to um, not have to comply with uh, anti-discrimination anti labor laws for certain categories of employees called ministerial employees. And the question I think the committee had was the interaction of, of that principle, which comes out of the Guadalupe case, that principle against the Vermont exception in labor law um, in 17 VSA 495 sub E, and how those two things work together, and what the history of that, that Vermont law is. So um, I've asked Damien to come in, because he's the expert uh, on labor law, and I have had posted uh, um, from yesterday, you've got the bill, and from today, you've got that section of labor law. I asked Daphne to post, so if Damien wants to pull that down or reference to it, it's there for you. So with that, I'll just turn it over to Damien. Great. Thank you, Jim. Um, so for the record, Damien Leonard, Legislative Council. Uh, so would it be helpful for the committee if I pulled up the section of labor law that Jim was referring to and shared it on the screen? Uh, I, I'm trying to adjust to how every committee works and some committees like it when I share my screen and others don't. Um, but let me pull that up for you if that's okay, Mr. Chair. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, if we look at this here, uh, this is, subsection 20, 21 VSA sub, subsection 495E. Uh, and what it says is that the provisions of this section prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity shall not prohibit or prevent any religious or denominational institution or organization um, or any nonprofit uh, organization uh, or educational organization that's operated, supervised, or controlled by, or in connection with a religious organization from giving preference to persons of the same religion or denomination, 
or from taking any action with respect to matters of employment that is calculated by the organization to promote the religious principles for which it is established or, or maintained. Um, so this language was enacted in 1992 in Vermont. Uh, at the time that Vermont added the uh, protections against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation to its law. Uh, in the addition of the words and gender identity were added in the mid 2000s when we added protections against discrimination on the basis of gender identity. Um, but this, to some extent, this uh, predates the two cases uh, at the Supreme Court which have extended the ministerial exemption uh, clearly to essentially uh, preventing the uh, anti-discrimination laws from being applied against uh, a, a religious leader. Um, so it, they're really, this comes out of a different um, period and background than the, the the case history, which we dealt with and discussed uh, last year. Um, I looked back today at what legislative history we have on this in the State House, and there may be more on the archives, but um, it, it, unfortunately with COVID, we can't get the uh, crates of documents from the archives on short notice anymore. Um, but there was no discussion of this in the floor votes in either the Senate or the House. Um, the, the discussion uh, that's recorded in our journals from that time really focused more on the issue of whether it was appropriate to extend protections against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation generally, rather than the issue of whether to add this carve out for religious organizations. Uh, this was added uh, in committee in the Senate. Um, or at least it, this is what passed the initial, uh, in the initial bill that came out of the Senate. Uh, and it passed without any floor discussion that's, that was recorded um, and uh, didn't get addressed in the House in terms of the recorded comments in the journal there. So uh, it seems that this was probably a carve out uh, in order to, um, address concerns that were raised by religious organizations uh, at the time that the bill was brought forward. Uh, and it's stayed in our laws since then with the only real amendment to it in the last 30 years being the addition of the words and gender identity uh, when we extended anti-discrimination protections on that basis. <clears throat> Does anyone have questions about uh, that? Yeah, Senator Persley. <clears throat> uh, thanks for the, the history. I guess, but I guess my question is, is there any case law, any testing of this provision whatsoever? Not that I'm aware of. Um, so it, the, the case law that's come out in recent years has been at the federal level. Um, and it's been on the issue of the ministerial exemption, um, which actually is, is broader than, than this uh, exemption. So the ministerial exemption um, essentially provides that, uh, at least with respect to a religious leader. Yeah. Um, I understand, I yeah. understand that the, the, the ministerial exemption in the Guadalupe case. But well, what I found interesting was, was this provision in the, in the Vermont statutes, which I don't know if it's been tested at all. And, and just to confirm again on the history, was it the original, the just original version, did it say the provisions of the section and then didn't have sexual orientation or gender identity or as originally written, it did include sexual orientation? Yeah, as, as originally written, it was added specifically with reference to discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and okay. gender identity was, a, a, I believe, a 2007 edition. Does it strike you as strange that they would say sexual orientation and then say about preference 
of persons of the same religion. So it's kind of like saying, because above it said you can't discriminate on sexual orientation, you can't hire a Protestant if you're a you can hire a Protestant if you're a Catholic church. It, so it seems weird to me to say because you can't discriminate uh, because of sexual orientation, you can discriminate based on religious preference. I don't see the connection between the two. So what this is essentially saying is that the prohibitions against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation basically don't operate to prevent a religious organization either from saying, uh, the, the first argument is saying, we're going to give preference to uh, someone who is either a member of our religion or uh, what's often discussed in these cases is, uh, are they in good standing with our religion? Um, so for example, uh, the, some of the language that um, I came across in a second circuit case from a Catholic school was that the, uh, the individual in order to be hired, uh, their employment contract basically said that they would, you know, that they were in line with the teachings from Rome, meaning that not only are you a practicing Catholic, but you're in line with the doctrine as it comes out of the Vatican, not necessarily you know, and not practicing something different from that. Um, and the, the same uh, could go for um, other instances where uh, within a particular broad religion, you may have uh, narrower teachings that are only followed by some members of that religion, right. or you may have um, instances where, for example, say you're, you're uh, broadly Baptist, but are you a Southern Baptist or another, uh, another um, subset of, of Baptist okay. uh, within that? And so that, that's one of the things there with the preference, um, and that's the same religion or denomination. The other piece here, and I think this gets more closely at what you're talking about, is taking action with respect to matters of employment to promote the religious principles for which it's established or maintained. And that essentially is saying, uh, if you're opposed to, in this case, uh, for example, well, this, this predates same-sex marriage, but if you're opposed to same-sex relationships uh, and you have someone who uh, is openly gay who applies for a position, you could deny them employment because that's contrary to your religious principles. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah. I just thought it was weird that they talked about the, the same religion, but I think the way you explained it is better because somebody could say, well, I'm a Catholic, but they would say, well, you're not practicing Catholic if you're in a same-sex marriage at the time. But yeah, and it, it makes a little more sense that way. But I, and as far as the second clause there about all they have to do is calculate by the organization that it's not promoting their principles, it seems very broad. And basically any religious organization could easily calculate this if they wanted to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, they could argue that uh, they're simply giving preference to someone who uh, maintains their core religious beliefs or who is a member of the same religion uh, and it, you know, one thing that I don't know, because I was, um, I was younger than almost as young as Astrid when this was adopted, not quite that young. Uh, I think I was 12, but, um, the, uh, one, one thing is that this may also have been taken from similar language at the federal level, um, that was put into some of the, or proposed or put into some of the federal statutes that were being adopted at the time. Um, to protect religious preference for, for example, uh, hiring a member of the same religion and not being accused of religious discrimination. Right. Um, so one so, more point, and then I'll stop, Chair. In, yeah, no, good. So why not any of the other protections above? You know, so this provision mentions those two, which I could get it are kind of hot button issues for some religious organizations. Well, but is it 
is it the case that they couldn't discriminate on age or gender or any of the other ones above? This only gives them the right to discriminate on those two items mentioned. Uh, yeah, this is the, um, within the context of the Vermont law, this clause just limits that sort of exception to sexual orientation and gender identity and doesn't extend it to age or disability or race. Um, although what we've seen with the federal precedent and the precedent in the second circuit is that the ministerial exemption effectively does extend it to that as long as the person qualifies uh, as a, a minister or other faith leader. So. Thank you. What if, <clears throat> back to Senator Perslick's question about case law, uh, well, what if we were to, to make a change to this? What, I mean, what, what sorts of, what if we were to say, all right, well, enough's enough. Um, you know, you can't discriminate <clears throat> on the basis of sexual orientation and gender if you're, no matter what religious institution you might be a part of. So um, I think the, the challenge with that is that the, uh, the ministerial exemption is grounded in the First Amendment of our US Constitution. Uh, and because the, the federal law and federal constitution are supreme, uh, that essentially you can argue that yes, state law might say this, but state law cannot supersede the federal constitution. Uh, and so the, the federal constitution prohibits the, the, the Supreme Court and the circuits have all uh, basically come out to varying degrees to say that the, the First Amendment of the federal constitution prohibits us from getting entangled in issues of religious leadership. Uh, and so if a religion chooses to uh, dismiss someone from a leadership position or a position where they're uh, teaching or ministering the faith, um, that it is not our place to interfere in that because that, uh, that gets into issues of religious entanglement where we're essentially telling a religion who they can have as a leader or a minister within their, within their faith. And that's not the place of, of the government in the United States. So um, that, that would be the issue here is even if we take this off the books, the ministerial exemption will still kick in uh, if there's the argument that the individual is a, a minister for want of a better word. Although that term, as the courts have repeatedly mentioned, that term you know, applies in many of the Christian faiths but doesn't necessarily apply in many of the other religions out there where the term may be different um, and where uh, you know, different faiths recognize different forms of ministry based on the, the teachings of their faith. Uh, and so what you essentially have to do is look at the function of the individual, but for many teachers uh, or you know, principals at a religious school, um, the, their job may include things like praying with their students, uh, taking their students to religious worship, um, organizing uh, religious practices at the school. Um, so uh, in those senses, if you look at the function of their job, uh, you, can, you can basically get back to the point where you say, yes, they're subject to the ministerial exemption, on the other hand, you may find that people who are not involved uh, in religious teaching at that school, um, let's say, uh, you know, someone who does maintenance on school property or um, has a purely administrative position and doesn't, um, doesn't carry out anything that's strictly religious, then perhaps there you could argue, no, the ministerial exception doesn't apply. So in that case, um, in that case, the protection that you'd look to is this protection under 495E, and there you could extend it and you could at least provide, uh, you know, the, 
or you could eliminate this and then extend protections under all of our anti-discrimination provisions to those individuals, but it would just be limited to that subset. Senator Persley. <clears throat> well, it, I think if we're gonna, if this bill is gonna move forward, I would propose that we strike this from the statute because I think it's just offensive on its face. And it's, even though the Supreme Court has the decision, it's similar to the issue that we have old covenants in Vermont, you can do some title searches on old homes that says that the home cannot be sold to Jewish people or people of color. Those are un unenforceable covenants, but since they're repugnant, they, they often, when they're discovered, get stricken from the title because people don't want to just have that on their title, even though they're completely unenforceable. So it, it'd be similar to here. I We don't need it in there because of the Supreme Court decision. So I would prefer that the statute just not have it in there. They can, because of the Supreme Court, they can discriminate against everybody on race, age, disability, whatever they want, if they could make this ministerial argument. Uh, so I just would rather that be the case that they make the argument uh, on the Supreme Court and not, not have something in the statute that would support such discrimination. Senator Hooker. I, I totally agree. Okay, and I think Senator Tindin was also saying yes, as do I. Um, okay. Great. <clears throat> we'll have Jim uh, and Ms. St. James work on that. Uh, do either of you have a comment before we, we move on? Uh, Jim or Beth? No, Jim? Sure. Okay. Uh, do we have other questions for Mr. Leonard while he's here? Uh, I don't see, I, I see. I just wanna ask, I, this is, uh -huh floating around in my head. I just can't, I, I'd like to know how you differentiate between what is a core value of a school and what is not. When you have a, an institution that's grounded in a, a religion and core values, how do you separate that from, you know, anything that goes on at the school, whether it's sports or or uh, you know the way you handle money how is that separated in law in a, in a court case basically well in a court case i mean how do you yeah kind of yeah by that mr leonard yeah so this is one of the uh this is one of the things that keeps legal scholars publishing on this issue um, because there's a lot of argument going back and forth. So the original case on this, this issue, Hosanna Tabor, uh, set out a, a sort of four guidelines that the court should look to, which included um, the title of the individual, the training that they had received, um, and uh, whether they held themselves out as in a being in a ministerial role, and then finally, uh, whether their duties reflected a role in conveying their religion's message um, and mission and carrying out its mission. Um, the the more recent case, the the Our Lady of Guadalupe school case, um, that one really. It said, you know, those those other three can be helpful, but what we really are concerned about is this function, um, and that. So, what you really have to look at in these cases is it becomes a case by case assessment by the church, where they're looking at is the role that the person had integral in conveying the religion's message uh, and carrying out its mission. Um, and this has become a, a, like I said, a subject of argument among legal scholars as to how far the, uh, the part of that decision that looked at the carrying out of the church's or the religion's mission, 
uh, extends to things um, that aren't related to actually conveying its message or its teachings. Um, and so, you know, I, I think there are questions about does a, and this is, this is something where the cases that I've seen at the Supreme Court and in the Second Circuit haven't dealt with issues of, for example, does this apply to, uh, for example, a coach that leads the students in prayer before games? Um, you know, uh, does that count as, you know, sufficiently ministerial? Um, and then, I mean, if I'm an administrative assistant in, in an office, like somebody would say, doing God's work by supporting. Mm -hmm. Right, supporting the, the mission of the religious the organization. Mission. And that right, that's right. been sort of the, you know, the sort of the maximum yeah. possible extent. But at, at least at this point in the Second Circuit and in the Supreme Court, we don't have a case that extends it to the point of saying, you know, this, the, the administrator or the accountant uh, or someone who is doing something that is a, a core function for that organization to continue its existence, but not necessarily related to the teachings of the faith. We, we don't have a case that actually extends it that far. The cases all deal with someone who is involved in teaching. Um, when it comes to the schools here. So a principal that leads students in prayers and organizes religious events, uh, teachers, um, and the three cases all happen to deal with Catholic schools. So teachers that lead the students in prayer, take the children to mass, teach the catechism, but also happen to teach other subjects at the school. Um, and in, in all of those cases, they've found that, you know, the, because they're involved in sort of the core religious teachings and their job expected to them to be sort of uh, teachers of the church's catechism and its faith and to be teaching consistent with the church's teachings, um, that they were ministers within the ministerial exemption. Um, so it at this point, I think it's it's safe to say that if the individual is involved in teaching the faith, they're covered by the ministerial exemption. I think it's an open question for now uh, if someone is is involved in another arguably core function to that organization's mission, but they're not teaching the faith. I think that that uh, it hasn't been clearly decided, but I'd say that that is much less at least in my reading of the cases here, that that's a much more tenuous argument for the ministerial exemption. And I think there's a strong argument there that the ministerial exemption wouldn't apply, but I also don't have a court case where um, we have a panel of, of appeals court judges or the Supreme Court coming down and, and making, uh, you know, sort of a, a decision on that and giving us some guidance as to how mm -hmm how they parse that out. Right, okay. Okay, thank you. Mr. Demeray, uh, any additional questions? I don't see any other questions that we had for Mr. Leonard on my, in my notes, but I don't know. If... No, uh, Sam Persick knowing to me that the title, title of the document I have posted has the wrong title number. So I'm gonna correct that for Daphne, but beyond that, no. And if you would make these, uh, the, the, some of the, the changes that we talked about yesterday and today, and yep. we'll take a look at a, a fresh draft next week. Sure. Yep. Uh, Mr. Leonard, any final comments? I think we're, we're okay. All right. Well, thanks mm -hmm. for joining us. Very much appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Uh, well, actually, while you're here, would you okay. be somebody that we would talk to about as it relates to businesses about a public taking? Is that something? Uh, no, I don't no. do takings law. Okay. Um, trying to think who covers takings law within our office. Um, I see Mr. Demaray may know. Well, I spoke to um, uh, David Hall okay. about this. And um, so he's the best person probably to have in. I will have Daphne have <clears throat> David Hall and then about that yeah. issue. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you.
You're Committee, welcome. The only other, <clears throat> excuse me, issue that we had on our agenda was to get an update from, um, I put my name there, but I don't know, Senator Hooker, did it come up this morning in committee uh, antigen rapid tests and whether or not uh, we would be able to uh, loosen up or any update on the, what's the word I'm looking for, the um, accessing them. Uh, of them. Um, I have to say I was remiss in re not reminding Senator Lyons to ask that question of nope. Dr. Levine, but we got into other discussions. Okay. Uh, so I'm not sure what the um, uh, what the supply is like, but Why, it thank you. didn't seem as if, I mean, I, I haven't seen anything that would suggest that it's a problem right now. And, um, you know, schools will have the antigen tests at the schools. Kids who test positive under the new paradigm would be sent home with antigen tests. And I'm assuming it's because we have a sufficient supply to accommodate them. And we'll find more, <clears throat> excuse me, more about this well, when uh, Secretary French and Dr. Levine come in next week. But I, uh, and I'll reach out also. But the idea, uh, or the ideal, if you will, uh, would be that there'd be enough to send home, and there'd be also enough for schools, so um, everybody can get tested. And it sounds like we might be moving in that direction. Okay, good. Anything else, committee? Okay. Mr. Demery, did you have a final comment? No. Nope. Oh, okay. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, clearly, uh, a lot of work to do ahead. Uh, so I hope everyone has a restful weekend. Thanks, everybody. And look forward to seeing you on Tuesday, unless you want to just give me a call to check in over the weekend on something or Zoom. Uh, I'll be around and just hanging out and love to hear from any of you. Great. Thank you. Uh -huh.